So, yeah, uh, before we start, we'd like to clarify that um, some people don't like the, the rock star term, uh, or maybe they feel uncomfortable about, maybe not the term, but the way in which uh, sometimes it's used um, or abused. Uh, we are going to talk about rock stars here in a, in a positive way. So for us, a rock star is the kind of developer that we think it's very, very good and we all look up to and, and admire and hopefully we'd like to, to become someday. But at the same time, uh, the term, sometimes the, the way in which uh, it, it has been coined makes it look like some kind of uh, high, uh, unachievable status up there in the Olympus of software development. And you know that, that makes it uh, a bit difficult to feel like, uh, it makes me feel like we are always chasing some kind of impossible thing. Um, does anyone here know any names of rock stars in the Drupal community? <coughs> yeah. Uh, I know a name or if I know them. Yeah, if you know any, you know, can, can you give any names of? Yeah, yeah for example. Um, so anyone here in the room feels like uh, he or, or she is a rock star? No hands? Well, that, that, that's funny because um, to me, I'm seeing already a few faces that I've known for a, for a long time here in this room. And I know that, uh, for me at least, they are rock stars. I consider them very good developers and I, I consider them to have the things that I'd like to have someday. Um, in a way, they are some kind of inspiration for me. Uh, but at the same time, they don't feel like they are rock stars. So to me, this suggests that there's a gap between what is really a rock star and what we consider a, that is a rock star based on what uh, we see on the internet. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, the general, the general feeling or the general consensus is that a rock star is someone who does all these things, right? Someone who knows everything uh, or pretty much everything uh, about the tool that they work with and of course uh, about some other tools like uh, you know the latest uh, new frameworks and anything that comes up uh, contributes a lot to Drupal core or Drupal contributed mo uh, modules and of course gives great talks at DrupalCon. But according to this scale of values or to this measure, I, I don't really, I don't feel like I'm a rock star, but I don't feel like I can become one. So the thing is, I don't feel like I can do all of this, but I still try to do it. I, I feel like I must, must be doing it in order to become a good dev developer. So the question is, why are we doing this? It doesn't really make uh, uh, a lot of sense. I suppose it, I, I don't know, for some people it will be because they just want to be famous or they just want recognition for the work that they do uh, in their jobs or out of their jobs. For me personally, it will be something that I do because I like to grow and, and I think it's, it's good for me. Uh, so I want to take like a next step in, in my career. So yeah, a rockstar developer is not me. It's never, never me. So something's wrong here. We, cannot, we can never achieve that, not, be, not me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you my personal story uh, as my career. I started my career like 15 years ago as a well, junior developer, of course. And, and then I, I was a senior developer. I was even a teacher for a while. And then uh, I was a lead developer or something like that. And I became a manager, project manager first, and uh, kind of a CTO in a small company. And I was doing it. Good, but I, I didn't feel very well doing that. It's, it, it wasn't my passion. I, I wanted to get back to the code, which is what I like, uh, fixing problems and designing great solutions and that kind of stuff. So I, I asked myself what I have to change my profession in order to uh, grow and be better, because that's what I want, right? And so I decided to, to be a rock star. I didn't call it a rock star by that time, but. I wanted, I wanted to be a, a recognized um, developer uh, in Spain and in, in the international community. And so, because I, the reason is that I, being just a programmer all my life, well, I felt shame with that idea. I couldn't say it loud. I was very young, but I couldn't see myself like uh, 
older and being just a programmer. Something was wrong in my head with that. So being a rock star, being a super good developer was something worthy. And then I set myself this goal. And, and then I, uh, <laughs> I had children and, and problems came and, well, many things. <laughs> And this, this, I think this message is not only in my head, it's, it's in many heads and it, it's out there in the society we live today. And well, I, I wanna tell you a story that I, I met a programmer, I met a, a project manager, she was a programmer before in a, in a previous agency. Uh, in a previous job we were talking one day and, and she, said, she said something like this. Uh, I don't understand people that, are, that still are programmers at the age of 40. And they, she said that as a, with, with rejection, disapproval. It's like they were mediocre, or not worthy. And that made me f think a lot about that because I, was, <laughs> I wasn't close at 40. I am super close at 40 now. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, I, I saw that I was defending myself because I was, okay, I'm not, yet, I'm not gonna be just a programmer. I'm gonna be a great programmer. That's, that's okay, right? But, but why? why? Why should I defend myself? Is it not worthy enough to spend your life doing a profession you love and you do it well? But something's wrong in, in the culture and the message. That's what I, what I feel. So we spend all this time trying to look for things that we can do uh, in order to achieve our next level. But the thing is that the next level for each person is not, is not the same for everybody, right? Uh, I'm a developer now, but maybe in a few years' time I realize that I'm not such a, as good developer and I'm surrounded by people that is smarter, th uh, smarter than me and maybe I can become just a team leader because I'm not as efficient as they are as programmers, but maybe I'm great at coordinating people and that bring a team together that is going to do wonderful things. Or maybe I want to become a project manager. So the thing is, why am I doing all the things that someone is telling me to do or the internet is telling me to do? It, it doesn't make sense because the story or the next level is different for, for every person. So, so yeah, there's no point in chasing these things like, like some kind uh, of creed. Uh, so what we wanted to do today, uh, or part of it, is to just take these myths and maybe analyze them in a way that they can start to be useful for us. They can, we can put them to work for us instead of letting them become death traps that will just set ourselves back in our careers. Uh, so the first one, uh, it's a simple one. A rock star knows everything. And this might sound uh, a bit too obvious, uh, <clears throat> but it's really, it's, it's really some kind of misconception that it's still uh, out there. And the thing is that uh, it's not really possible. And in order to, to, to realize of this, we just need to talk to someone that we consider a, a rock star. And of course, we, think, we tend to think that these people that know so much are, you know, they know everything because when we are talking uh, to them about their particular area of expertise, of course, they know a lot of things. And that uh, gets us into the false feeling or the false idea that they just know everything. They are equally good at pretty much everything. But the thing is, is that it's not really possible. So we just get rid of this and, and, and stop using the word experts as if it meant to, to know absolutely everything on a given uh, field. It just means that you have a deep expertise or a lot of skill in that thing, but you don't need to, to know absolutely everything. The second one is one uh, of my favorites. Uh, I've been ranting about this for <laughs> quite a bit. Um, so another misconception is that we have to be up to date with the latest new and, and shiny technology. We have to to learn React and Angular, and then another thing comes out, and now it's Vue.js, and there are all these JS frameworks, and all these, not only JS or front-end, just even uh, in the back-end as well, uh, like Laravel, Silex, and a lot of new tools and things that we, we, we are supposed to be doing. But the thing is that there's, first, is is not really possible, and the, the great thing is that it's not even necessary. It's perfectly okay to just learn these things when when we need to use these things. Of course, maybe if I'm a team leader or, or a CTO, I need to be more or less on top of the different things that uh, I have at my disposal, but, but I don't need to know them uh, to a very high level. 
And the important thing here, or at least what has worked for me better, is uh, just to, to think about them as tools, not as something that will be better or worse. Just to think them as something that they are supposed to, to solve a problem. So instead of trying to learn new things just because the internet is telling us, maybe we should start to, uh, or we should try always to make sure that we are solving a problem when we learn a new tool, and, and that's the important thing. That's what gives or that makes me valuable as a developer. Clients will pay for me just to solve their problems, not to create problems for them. So, and often the the use of new technologies will carry a lot of problems, like you have to change your CI processes, uh, you have to train your internal team, and maybe not everybody can follow the same pace. You, have, you, you will discover uh, new things uh, along the way. And it's fine, but of course we need to evaluate whether that's a cost worth taking at, on, a, on a given time. And the thing is that they get deprecated so, so quickly. Uh, I, I remember um, a few years ago, uh, my employer gave me uh, like two weeks to work on whatever I wanted. And I, and, and, and I spent these two weeks learning a lot. Uh, I already knew some Node.js, so I thought, well, maybe I should uh, start looking into Angular and, and this kind of uh, stacks. And I spent like two weeks learning a lot of things. And I was so excited because I learned so many new things, so many cool things that will allow me to do uh, or to solve problems in a way different than Drupal. And then I was so excited about you know, maybe making a, or doing a, a little workshop for my team. And, and showing them what I had learned. And then two weeks, two weeks after I had spent that time, the, re, uh, the Angular team said, okay, we are going to rebuild it and we are going to change all the API. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, well, <laughs> those were two weeks, you know, like I, I just lost most of the time. Of course, I, knew, learned, I, I learned some new things that were still useful, but most of them were deprecated. And the reason why I hate this one so much is because I, I believe, personally, it's one of the main source of problems like imposter syndrome or anxiety. It's, the thing is, uh, early adopters and evangelists of these new technologies are often so loud on the internet that we fool our, ourselves thinking that if we are not learning these things and if we, don't, if we are not good at them, we will be obsolete in two years. But the reality is just the opposite. In two years, if these technologies are still around, it will mean that they are actually solving a problem for everybody, a common problem, not a problem that is just for Netflix or for Walmart or whatever. And at that point, you know, they will be more stable, it will be easier to adopt them, it will be easier to, to find documentation. So, so yeah, this is, a, this is a big one, but I think there's some things that we should think about here. And all these... Uh it adds to this uh, sensation that a rock star has uh, so much time spending his or her time in learning new things, have pet projects, um, contributing a lot in not only code, but whatever, um, organizing events, uh, giving presentations, and so many things. And we can be, um, we can feel like we don't have time enough to to reach that, that rhythm. It's like impossible, right? Well, I don't think we should, I don't think we need to spend extra time beyond 40 hours. It's only optional. It should be something like we, we wanted to do because it is important for us or maybe we have our other priorities or hobbies in our life or even other profession. So um, what if I want to be a, a musician in my free time? I want to, or I have a, I don't know, I'm a coach of a soccer team or with the children or f so many things that I, or just walk or just work on my relationship with my wife or be there with my children, actually playing with them. I, I've, I've seen myself many times saying no to my daughter. Uh, Daddy, would you play with me? No, no, I have to work. And it wasn't actually work. It was me just doing another thing, maybe looking at Twitter or some article or some something. And, and I didn't feel well doing that. And I've been reflecting on that because I don't want to be, my daughter to have problems in the future because her, her dad wasn't there, you know? There are so many, so many things and so many problems in our relationships and in our health that we can, we can have if we don't 
spend our time in what is important for us, that we should stop this and, and start saying no to many things and, and saying yes to the things that are important for us, that can be also contributing and, and doing something else in your free time, but we should take care of it. The, the message for me is that it's not necessary. And what if you want to be a, a developer just half of the day? Because maybe you're a father or a mother that want to spend your afternoon and evening with your children, or maybe you have another profession or you're helping in your parents' shop or whatever. Or you are starting a new project, totally different, or you have a blog or whatever. So many things you can do in your life. So there are other professions where one can be respectable and very good just doing his or her job in five hours a day or four. So we could, we can. Um, well, also say that, uh, I want to say that it's very healthy to do uh, different things uh, out of your laptop. It's, it's going to help your, your creativity. Sometimes you, Sometimes I, I just I'm stuck with something and I go for a walk or do something completely different and when I come back two hours later on the day, it's, it's like magic, it's, oh, I see the solution now. And well, there are many studies about this. If you, if you use your mind a lot in your computer if, and you do something very different like music, something creative, it's gonna help you to be better at your profession too. So that's help. And one more thing I wanna say, I, I've seen I've seen uh, some, uh, some jobs that require uh, open source contributions in order to hire people. And I don't think this is a good idea because of all this. Yeah, you don't know what's, what's important. You can value that, it's, it's something valuable. But requiring that, not everyone has the luxury of, of spending uh, time of this. No one has, uh, has um, have the luxury of um, being in a, in a company that understands open source and allow you to contribute in, in the working time, so we should take care about these things and, and value more, more things and not setting more barriers. So th this one has beaten myself as well uh, in the past. So I'd like to spend some time out of work reading stuff or working on side projects, but it, for me it's like some you know it it goes with periods. Sometimes I. I spend a few months working on, on those side projects, but maybe then I'm I'm not feeling like it for another two months, um, and that's fine. Whenever I feel like doing it, I just do it. But in the past, I've been forcing myself sometimes to just do something out of the the working hours, which is stupid. I was I I will feel guilty if I didn't do it because I was like, oh man, some, some someone is going to get ahead of you, and you have to be working, you have to you know to get better. And that's really stupid. If I'm doing my work uh, and I'm doing it well, I don't have to. If I, if I like doing it, then that's perfect, but I don't have to force myself. Another myth is that Rockstar writes perfect code. Um, and to me, this is a, a dangerous thought. And <laughs> personally, I, I, I mean, I might look really stupid, but I've been beaten by this one uh, as well. In the past, uh, I, I remember having passed, I mean, I was quite junior, but I remember having passed some code from someone where there was a part that didn't quite click, didn't quite make sense to me. I thought that it would fail, but then I thought, yeah, maybe it's me not understanding this properly. And I, would, and I, and I said, yeah, okay, let's merge it. Uh, let's merge the code. And it was just because the person that had written that code is so brilliant and, and is such a great developer and makes so, ma so few mistakes that I thought it will be fine. And yeah, let's say that the, the, the following day, uh, the real time information on the project that we were working on was not so real time. Um, so, so yeah, this is a dangerous thing because we are, every time we think that someone writes perfect code just because who he is or who she is, uh, we are missing a chance of uh, challenging some, some piece of code and learning something because even if it's right, then you know, we'll get answered and we might be learning something new. So that's good. A consequence of thinking this is that we are afraid sometimes of showing code that is incomplete. But this is, again, something quite stupid. Um, I mean, it might not happen to everyone, but it happens to some people. Um, <clears throat> 
it's fine to show code that is incomplete, even if it's rubbish, even if it's all a, <laughs> a huge function that is not completed, but maybe we can get some good feedback from someone. Like, uh, you know, you're fetching the data in this wrong way and it will become a performance, a performance problem with the amount of traffic that we will have. Or have you, have you thought about the structure in this in some other way? In fact, if we think about Drupal and why it has come so far, it's because people started contributing things that were not perfect at all, and we just, you know, got on the went to the issue queues and started to contribute uh, to the best of our capabilities. And about the feedback, we should be trying to 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 be nice when we give feedback to colleagues as well. Um, that's one of the things that can make us really good developers and good colleagues. Just praising for the good things rather than jumping straight on the on the on the bad things or on the things that need fixing uh, the problem is that some of us identify in some way with the code that we write or with what we produce and so when someone wants to give us some constructive code some constructive criticism even if it's if it's negative we may feel attacked ourselves because we identify ourselves with the thing that we produce which is stupid um, so yeah Let's try to, to give good feedback to people, and when people gives us, gives us bad feedback, we don't have to see them as enemies or someone wanting to annoy ourselves. We just need to, maybe they're just doing it in the wrong way, but that's still fine. Let's be smart and let's cherry pick the feedback. <laughs> let's, get, you know, let's remember the feedback that is useful uh, to us and that allows us to remember things. So in, in this topic of code perfection and code completion, I'd like to talk about something quite related, which is uh, monkeys. Um, so I read this story, I don't know if it's still a thing or not, but I read this story in a book um, called The Passionate Programmer by Chad Fowler. And he tells this story about monkeys in South India and, and how big of a problem they were to people because they were always stealing, uh, stealing food from people's hands, right? Uh, from uh, street markets, from everywhere. Any chance they, they had, they would steal the food. And South Indian, uh, the people from, from India came with this idea of digging, uh, digging holes on the ground and throw cooked rice on them. And the idea was that the, the, the monkeys would put their hands and grab the rice, but the holes were done in a way that they were bigger on the inside. So when the monkeys grab the rice, the, their hand would become a fist and it would then come out. <laughs> And of course, you know, that's a silly thing. Normally you will say, okay, I can't get the rice, but the monkeys instead will fight against the ground <laughs> just to get the rice out, uh, instead of just dropping it there and, and leaving. So the book goes with this story to explain the, the concept of value rigidity, which is what happens when we give so much value to something that uh, we are no longer able to objectively question that thing anymore. And to me, this is one of the most harmful things that we can do to ourselves, not only as developers, but in our careers in general, whatever we are. It's a very human thing. It's not even just related just to code. So some examples of, of value rigidity is when we insist that only one technology is going to, we are discussing with our team what we should do, and we insist that only one technology is going to, to solve something, or that some other technology is really awful, even though we don't really have that much experience with it, or just because in the past it didn't work out for us, or when we push back uh, a code, uh, yeah, some piece of code that is, that is fine, it has no bugs, it's working, maybe just because it doesn't follow the design pattern that we had in our mind, or that we thought that it should follow. So we, are, we, we will be able to be much better developers if we just identify when we are falling into these kind of traps. Because the thing with this is that it's very easy to fall into them, but it's very easy to, to avoid them as well. We just need to identify that we are, uh, that we are falling into them and just you know, thinking about things uh, uh, analytically. And even when we do this and, and you know, we, we take all the measures to, to do our job uh, to the, to, in the best possible way, sometimes we'll fail and that's perfectly fine. We just embrace that as a way to learn, and, and that we keep trying. Yeah, um, many people have uh, are afraid to make mistakes and, and show their code because of that. I I heard a story about Tom, uh, we don't know if it's true, but uh, they say that uh, Thomas Edison. Well, it, he made a lot of experiments uh, with bulbs and a lot of uh, thousands of prototypes that, that that didn't work. 
And uh, they asked uh, him about, about that, and there's a quote, which is, I haven't failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And this is very enlightening to me because, you know, uh, science uh, constantly teaches us that um, we need to embrace the path of failure as, as something positive, as something that, that uh, we can learn from. There is a lot of value in mistakes. And, and there is, this is the way to, to success. To success. Um, another, another thing I want to talk is, uh, I, th I feel like in our society, uh, we are educated to uh, reward results above all, but not so much the way to get there. If it's a clean way, it's a, if it's a dirty way, doesn't matter many times, and, and of course, not error. Some, sometimes we punish them or we, uh, we reject them. So uh, again, we should reflect on that and, and try to educate ourselves in another way, like, like we do with our children, like in the slide before with that pet. Uh, our children can make two steps and then fall, but we are, not, we are not regretting that. We are saying, okay, we are celebrating that small win. Right, because he made two steps. That's awesome, and we don't care if he if he has fallen. So, um, but I don't know. Sometimes when, when we are older, uh, we stop uh, not doing that, and instead of celebrating the, the small steps, we are focusing more on the on the mistakes and and punishing uh, punishing ourselves many times and others for that. So, we should try to educate ourselves in a, in a different way. I think, and we can learn from test driving development too where we start with a fail. You, know, you write a test, and there is no code, so there is a failure. And it's OK. And now we are going to, to make it work, right? So, and also, debugging teaches that there is a lot of value in, in errors, because when you have to, to chase an error, debugging, you, le you learn a lot from the code, from the workflow, from many things. So there is a lot of value there. Don't forget that. Um, Sorry. Uh, and there's another myth, which is a rocks to memorize everything. Um, I, I, yeah, I haven't memorized that. I, I have to speak now, so, <laughs> as you can see. So I have a very lazy memory. And actually, uh, I think the only song I, I know the lyrics from is Happy Birthday. Well, I know too, because I know the, the Spanish version too, so that's, that's great. But <laughs> really, it's not that I'm bad at memorizing things. It's just that I'm very lazy, and my, I think my brain refuses to, to learn things that I can just look up in 15 seconds. So, um, but, but I felt sh shame, and I felt insecure many times for not, mm, for not having certain things memorized, like what does every Drupal hook or, or the parameters or some functions, common functions like PHP, STR or blah, blah, or whatever. So I have to look at it every time, and it's OK for me. And, and but you kind of think that Rockstar doesn't need that. They know everything, every little detail of everything. And of course, that's not true again. Man, but I thought that many times. And when I was going to, to present my first uh, technical talk in the Drupal camp, I was super scared because of the questions, because what if they where they find, find out that I'm an imposter here. I and mean, there's so many things that <laughs> I don't know and I have to look at in the internet, but I can't do that. I can't do that in, if I am asking a question. In a talk. So I was super scared about this. So the good thing is not, it's not necessary. Life is not an exam. Uh, we, we come from an education again that uh, we, we learn to memorize everything <laughs> for the exams, but that is no longer um, needed these days with the internet, thank God. <laughs> you go. So, something that has worked for me in the past and today <laughs> is to just learn the fundamentals of something. As he said, there, it doesn't make any sense to just memorize absolutely everything because I, I will forget about most things, at least the technical, the exact details of how to do something in a given framework. If I'm working with different frameworks, it's very easy to 
uh, you know, if I stop doing Drupal for a month and start working on a symphony project, when I come to Drupal, maybe I start to mix things up and I will forget about things. That's, that, that's the way it is. So something that works for me is to just learn the fundamentals instead. It's much more useful for me to learn and to know how to identify, for example, the situations in which I, I have to use a, a, back, a background process or, um, or, a, or a task queue than knowing how to implement this in Drupal. I know the Drupal API and with remember, just remembering a few things, it will be enough. When I need to do this in Drupal, then I will just look up the, the API documentation and, and just do it in a, in, a, in a few seconds. And learning the fundamentals, it's what will make, is, will, will make it easier for us to start learning new technologies if we want to, to do so. Because then we identify in every different stack when we need to do things in one way or, or the other. And again, the details can be looked up in, in seconds. So don't, we, at least for me, it works better to not, be, uh, not become very obsessed with you know, knowing, uh, having to remember everything. And also, what works better is to just come up with my own set of tricks and tools that make me for more, more efficient, like live templates in PHP Storm or code snippets, or even sometimes I've built my own code generators just because they will save me like an hour or two of work. Um, so that's one of the things that, for example, has worked better for me. And when I talk about resources, uh, I talk as well about people. Sometimes the best resources to ask uh, as one of our colleagues. And sometimes, many times, uh, the the best resource is is people, is asking other people. But that involves some vulnerability, vulnerability because if you have to admit uh, what I don't know. And here comes something that I, I really consider a rockstar ability, which is something like this quote. My biggest professional development was getting comfortable admitting what I don't know. From Jessica Ross, I love that quote. It's not only admitting what I what you don't know, it's getting comfortable doing that. That's, that's a rockstar thing for me, a real rockstar thing. That, that's something I can, I can do. It's not easy that I... Now I'm, I feel like I'm in a point that I can say that. I wasn't in the past. In the past, I was so scary. I started as a freelance, and I, I wanted to have my personal brand in the Drupal world, in the technical world, and I, 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 couldn't, I just couldn't ask things in, out there in IRC or, or Twitter or other public spaces because I was worried about what people are, what are, what they are gonna think when they find my stupid comments in, in the, in the internet uh, three years from now. Well, I we are learning step by step. Um, to be comfortable, being vulnerable uh, requires um, requires a filter. Requires uh, because you you can expect that other people can be rude or cannot understand that. I can say oh, you don't know that. Like, but um, we should we should try not to make that. From our, for ourselves, like it's this is something that it's it's a person problem. It's a, it's the other person comment. It's the other person attitude. It's not us. We should we should try to to set this filter, and and normally you're not gonna find that in in the answer. You, normally people are gonna value that you're being vulnerable, that you're being authentic and and real, and you trust yourself to admit what you don't know and and you're capable of of uh, achieve what you, what you need to achieve just by asking. So, so that's a good thing, and people normally see good things about that. But we should. somehow this is not uh, in our head. This is not a, a common thought. So why, this is why uh, things like imposter syndrome are so common in, in our culture today. I guess everyone has, everyone knows about imposter syndrome. Um, imposter syndrome is uh, being unable to acknowledge uh, your strengths and value, what you're good at, and focus on, on the opposite, focus on, on what you lack, what you don't have, what you don't know. And the two main symptoms uh, is refusing to take uh, challenges, job, projects, 
and, and also burn out to try to achieve those super high standards you keep in your head. I felt that way many times. I, as I told you, I felt that way in the Drupal community because I, I, get, uh, I, I was known very early by this many, many Spanish uh, folks, but I, I, I felt like, okay, people know me, so people think I'm, I'm a good developer, but I'm just, I don't know anything because I was just uh, always uh, focusing on what, what I don't know, what I don't know, what I don't know. And, and also it happens to me in the, when I started Lullabot, I, well, I didn't even <laughs> thought that I could be there. So it was my dream, but okay, they hired me. I have tricked them somehow. And, and when I was in the first retreat, I heard that uh, they were talking about imposter syndrome and how that imposter syndrome thing was something that everyone feels when they start at Lullabot. And that's, that was a huge relief because I learned that they weren't expecting me, expecting, expecting from me any high standards, any super uh, rock star myths that I had in my head. They, were, they just were expecting me to be me and to be motivated and give the, the value I can give just being me because they, they just hired me as I am. And that, that was a huge relief. So, we can change some messages in a way that we can create a future that where imposter syndrome is not so it's not so common. One one of the tips or one of the advices that some psychologists give to people to overcome this, uh, I mean this wasn't for me, it was for a friend of mine, of course, uh, is to just have a notebook on your desk next to your laptop and whenever someone says something good to you or gives you praise for something, just write it down. Write it down there and just leave it. And whenever the thing kicks in and you start to feel like you're not worthy for whatever reason, just um, open the notebook and just read the notes and just, you know, one minute and just get on with your life. Uh, so where does this come from? Um, we hear a lot of messages out there of a scarcity, that we are not enough, that we have not time enough, money enough, we are not healthy enough, safe enough, many things. But I find especially dangerous, and we don't talk much about this, that we are, that, that message that we are not extraordinary enough. Somehow in this world, um, having a, an ordinary life and having a meaningless life has become synonymous has become the same thing in our minds. So we try to do a lot of things in the quest for the extraordinary, like trying to find, try hard to find our purpose or set, setting new goals, to make achievements, to get higher, to step out of our, son, our comfort zone. Many, many messages that make, can, make, can make sense in a context, but all together are creating a, a pressure to look for the extraordinary because in the end, we need to, to be happy or something like that. But what if we are missing the, what is really important for us? Like the ordinary moments, I think the ordinary moments in our lives, like playing with our children, like having relationships, like doing things that has a lot of value for us and are aligned with our values, is where we can find the most joy. I mean, there is an exercise which is uh, thinking about, uh, it's a scary exercise, uh, but um, in coaching, on, in, when, you, when you think about your, if, what, what happened if you're gonna pass away one year from now or two years from now or six months, that helps you to connect with what's important for you. And, and people that, 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 has, that have experience that are um, close to death, they, uh, they came back uh, doing something different, like saying that uh, they love someone, or they don't come back to be a Rockstar developer normally, so that could help. Maybe we should just try to live in a, an authentic life rather than chasing the extraordinary. And I love this authenticity definition from Brennan Brown, this authenticity is the daily practice of letting go of who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. So to be authentic needs daily practice. Uh, I need to self myself, accept myself as I am, 
daily with a smile. I can't expect to feel uh, worthy working, uh, looking at the outside. And I, and I don't need to, to do anything to feel proud. Well, uh, finally, here is my, my last reflection. I think if you love yourself just as you are, without expectations, without conditions, and you can trust yourself, offer something special and unique, because every one of us are unique and special, like our experience, like our creativity, and I think we can give much more value. And you will probably find the most joy and peace. So let's think twice about chasing all these things that we consider that we should be doing in order to become better in our lives and in our careers. We can offer or we can be valuable in so many other ways that it doesn't really make sense to follow blindly all, all these things. Of course, it's fine to go after them if we want to be speakers and we want to give presentations, and that's great. But you know, it's, it's fine to be vulnerable, it's fine to, be, to keep your feet on the ground, you don't, need to be you don't have to be learning new things all the time. Uh, in reality, the problems are with the tools, uh, I mean, the problems are where your clients are, and you can offer so much value just to your teammates and to your customers just by being able to be on Earth, just solving the problems there, not jumping from one technology to another all the time. The important thing here is really that you, you do whatever you want. If you want to go and do all the things that we gener generally agree that are common traits in Rockstar developers, that's fine. But just do it because you, f you like doing them, not because someone is imposing all these things into you from the outside, OK? So yeah, I like Monty Python as well. <laughs> um, the, the real important thing is that we do these things because we want, not because someone is telling us that, you know, that's what you should be doing. So just set your career and your life in the direction that you want it to be. Uh, in my case, that will be something that, that it will be even better for me because if I'm just happy doing the things the way I want, I'll be even better doing the other things that people is supposed to have in order to be rockstar developers. I won't have any pressure. So, uh, so yeah, that will be my message. And I wanted to put this, um, I think it's a liberating message and takeaway. You don't have to do anything. In this life, you don't have to do anything. Just embrace who you are. And acknowledge uh, and value your own strengths and creativity. And of course, uh, well, again, break the myths of the rocks to developer and believe in yourself. Thank you. So, um, yeah, uh, great that you have questions already. Well, in case some of you are shy, um, I have written some questions for you to inspire, to <laughs> invite you to talk. Go ahead. Thank you. A hell of a lot. That was very inspiring to me, hearing all that. Um, I have been, I think most of us have been, through just that, and you managed to put some words on it. I'm, I, I feel really deeply thankful for you doing that. Um, is that better? Um, I have done some study about the subject as well because I was, I was suffering from the imposter syndrome uh, a few years back, and I think your, your, your slides are missing uh, an important piece that helped me through that, uh, with, which is someone once told me that um, empathy is the easiest way to success. Um, you, rarely, you rarely get hired or you rarely get accepted into a community or anywhere in the world without some sort of empathy. You rarely get accepted on wisdom alone. So. Empathy precedes wisdom. 
Yeah, I, I'm absolutely agree. And yeah, I cannot talk about many, many things that I would like to talk more. So great. And, and more things that I have to learn. I, we have this, yeah, this slide with resources. The first one is a book that I love, which is The Gift of Imperfection, that I recommend you all. It's from Brene Brown. And she, she's, uh, she studies uh, uh, happy people, well, more in the, in the, in the joy, meaning, not in the ha, happy, happy. But um, one of the, there are kind of three keys to, to joy, and one of them is empathy, so I'm glad you say that. There's a lot more to, to say and to study and to learn. Very good. Well, I'm going to keep this. Hi. Uh, first, thank you to include the woman in the, inside the talk. I got it. <laughs> it's not common. I, I would like to share with you a history that happened to me last year. That was my first DrupalCon. I didn't know anyone. I didn't know any rock stars. And I was free to talk with everyone about everything. And I was in a dinner. And someone asked it like, what do you, I mean, what you would like to change about Drupal? But no, it was not to me, it was in general. And I started to say what I thought that we should change. And then someone told me like, but do you know with whom you are talking about? And I really, I, I didn't know. But I mean, it's just not because it's me. I think that we have to open the doors to who has something new to say about it's also that we as a community, we put this person as a rock star, and then nobody's able to talk with them and to say what we really think about. And I wanted also to, the, to share with you my point of view about my professional life. I like to change technologies. I didn't know that was something common for some person and take me time to accept myself, what I wanted. I don't want to be a specialist in something. I want to share technologies because it's what I really enjoy. And I want to be a developer. But it took me a lot of time to accept that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your, your story. I think as a community, we suffer as well of things like tunnel vision. Uh, so sometimes. We feel like, you know, if an opinion or some feedback comes out from outside of the community, it's like somehow less valid. But you, you're right. We have to listen to everybody, really. It's, we have to be open with anything. Um, every opinion has value and every opinion counts. And I think it's fine as well if you want to be... Uh, it, it is true that generally you will read a lot that you should be an expert in one thing instead of spreading yourself too much. But uh, I think it's perfectly okay if you want, if you know, if you find more joy learning different technologies, and you can offer a lot of value with that as well. So, uh, you know, I'm glad that you shared your story, and I, I will encourage you to just keep doing, uh, keep doing, or taking your career that way. Yeah, and I think that also has another kind of value because when you know different technologies, you can get the best thing of everything, and then improve the other technology. Absolutely agree with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey guys, uh, I want to say both things. No, no, those both uh, two things are related to Drupal, and those two things are uplifting. First, who in this room has ever felt uh, the imposter syndrome? Raise your hands. Okay, news here. Richard Feynman. Nobel Prize in Physics suffered from imposter syndrome. So it's no one, no one is free from that. And that's how he solved that. Uh, he just received an insane offer from some university. I think it, it was Princeton, but I'm not sure. Uh, he felt the imposter syndrome for, some, uh, for quite some time. And then suddenly stopped it. What, what the heck? I, I, and I'm feeling, though, they know me. I'm... Uh, scientific, uh, that means they have my papers, they have read my papers, they know my work, they know me, they know my CV. If they want to pay me for that, uh, it's probably okay. Just stop, uh, and he, uh, stop feeling that. They already know me. There's, a, there's no trick on that. They, I don't have to feel bad about that. Uh, 
The second thing is about um, being 40 years old. Uh, so, uh, who in this room is over 40 years old? Uh, eh, okay, not long, thanks God. Um, the thing is that, uh, what's the future for people in technology over the certain age? Well, uh, good news for that, there are companies that pay for, for this expertise, pay well, and expect you uh, to, to behave accordingly. Pay a lot, respect, you, respect your work. Happens, and you can check yourself. For example, anyone here, uh, people who knows the video game Batman Arkham Knight, just, you don't have to know that. Just go look on YouTube for the, credit, for the credits video. In the credits video, there's a pattern that repeats again and again. It's a long list of people, and you see city design. Senior designer, senior designer, senior designer, senior designer, senior designer, all senior designers, then two designers, and then two juniors. And the uh, same with coders. Senior developer, senior developer, senior developer, developer, junior developer. They always repeat the same pattern. Some interns here and there, the, the bulk of the work for people with experience. And then they put young blood into the project slowly, not everything at a time, not hiring 10 interns and one senior. No, they do the, exactly the other way around. And, that, and what happens uh, when you do that is games like Arcanite, uh, this create an incredible piece of work. But there are companies out there that understand that you can do something than Arcanite with interns. Those companies do exist. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for, for the session. It's been really inspiring. And uh, well, I, I want to admit uh, publicly that I suffer from <laughs> imposter syndrome. Uh, the more I know, the, more, uh, the less I think I know. And yeah, it's something that most of us suffer. And yeah, I am, I am not shy to, <laughs> to admit it. But I want to, to ask you uh, about some advices. Uh, what common things can we do to reduce, uh, or, to, or to try to reduce this imposter syndrome? Thank you. Well, um, there's a, a great talk out there, uh, the last one, which, which is it's a lightning. There are so many tips to there to overcome imposter syndrome. One of them is very important is because of the reason is that you don't acknowledge what you, what you know and your, your values and your, your strength. Uh, getting track, actually, like in, in paper even, getting track of every good feedback of everything you're doing well, it's going to help you a lot to see that and see, okay, I'm not so bad. So that's one of my favorites from that talk. But for the rest, see that talk. And, and there's other things, in, and my message here is this talk, this, this motivation of my, my presentation is I want you to, to think that we all can change slightly the culture we are in and, and make, uh, create an environment where, where imposter syndrome is, is less common. And there are a lot of things that we can do to, uh, to show us more vulnerable or to, to uh, welcome better vulnerability, for instance, Dan Abramov, which is the, the co-author of uh, Redux from React, a rockstar, JavaScript rockstar, right? Well, he uh, started um, a hashtag in Twitter asking uh, very basic questions about things that he was willing to admit that he doesn't know. And, and the hashtag is uh, junior there for life. And it was a symbolic thing, of course, not a junior, right? But it was telling outside, it's okay to ask basic questions. And, and many people follow that. And in general, we, we live in a culture where we are many times we're showing our best smile, our best face, our best vacation picture in Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And we're not so, well, we should embrace our shitty work, you know? We should, we should show it. We should be more vulnerable in our message out there and, and show everything because otherwise we're creating the opposite. We're creating a, a feeling that the that the society is made by impossible smile and happiness standards, that we are not like that. So 
yeah, of things. Be creative. <laughs> I wanted to give my point of view about that topic. What I try to do is to be clear with myself and to, to be clear with the people. I mean, I know what I know, or I think that I know what I know, and I'm not ashamed to say I don't know that part. It doesn't mean that I don't want to learn it. I want to learn everything. But at the moment, I don't know something, and it doesn't matter. And what I would like to propose you to think about if you can make a session or if you can make a question. Because for some of us, like me, it's not something that is going to come to me like, oh, you are great, you can make sessions, you can make questions. I force myself to do it, but I think that it's something good for me and also good, good for the community because we learn from each other. Thanks. Thank you. We're running out of time. One more intervention. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, actually, there was uh, one slide about kind of the time management, uh, and I just wanted to um, ask you what do you think uh, those people who are like uh, putting their another four, six, even more hours after the mandatory eight, I would say, uh, those are not kind of workaholic instead of just being superstar or rock star or whatever pop star. Uh, because sometimes I feel uh, there are colleagues of mine, or even uh, there were a few, uh, who never stopped. Like, we had to leave the office at 6, for instance, then they, they brought home uh, all, the, all the work. Uh, in the next day, they provided something that was not the best, but still we, we, we felt uh, they put there a lot of resources. So workaholism work, uh, versus being rock star. Well, um, I think, um, well, there's, there was yesterday a, a very good talk. Uh, it was Marina, I don't know, the, the, well, Marina, uh, it was about being a leader, something like that. You can, you can or a manager in a human track. Uh, and they, they made us, uh, uh, we, we did a, an exercise, a mindfulness exercise, very basic, aligning our values and our actions in our life. And many people can see that actually our actions are not, uh, are not aligned with our values and that, that mind changing. So what's the important thing is if, if you're doing what is important for you, if people are doing what is important for each person, that's what matters. And, and because not doing things because I, ma because I should, because that's what you're supposed to be, and th do things because uh, I must. You know, it's because that's something that comes from you that is really important for you. That's, that's the only thing I have to say. Uh, there's one thing about this. My, my take is that that might happen sometimes. Uh, I've, sometimes I've had to work some extra time as well. You know, there's a tight deadline and sometimes it happens. Uh, and of course, you know, that, that, that attitude when there's a problem and your colleagues are there and they are working their asses off to get the thing done, that, for me, that's one of the things that makes someone uh, that makes someone a rock star as well. You know, being there when you need it. But that is not a, re a requirement for someone to be a rock star, because that's something that can happen once in very specific cases, and then that's okay. But if it happens often, it will lead to burnout and is really not healthy. And if it happens often, well, that suggests to me that the problem is someone up there in the in, in another layer is not the problem with developers, and the developers should not be you know having to spend all that extra time working on that. So I think we run a little bit out of time. So thanks everyone for attending and for your questions. Uh, if you don't mind taking a minute to you know, rate us uh, at some point in the day, that will be th great. Thank you.